Um, and thank you to the university and the organizers. It's great to be here. Um, as Gian said, I work with the Cities Alliance, um, but I was also the co-chair of the organizing committee for the Cities IPCC conference. Um, so that was sort of how I got linked into this. Um, and it's great to have this national level follow-up to our international conference that we had um, in March. So. I'm going to go through, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Cities Alliance, my organization, um, and some of the initiatives that we're involved with that I think are relevant here. Um, and then I'm going to go into a little bit of detail by, uh, about the city networks that were involved in the Cities IPCC um, conference. Um, very briefly, I'll touch on the Cities IPCC partnership, and then I want to talk a little bit about how I see the research agenda and what different city networks and the urban community is doing already and what we can definitely do um, to better on. Um, so first, Cities Alliance. Um, so we're actually a multilateral organization. We're hosted by the United Nations, the not very well known United Nations Office for Project Services. Um, we're a membership organization. We have 34 members. Um, and our mission is really about um, enhancing the well-being of the urban poor. Um, and we have a focus on city development, um, especially with secondary cities, um, and looking at this cross-sectoral um, and cross-scale, um, so involving the national, city, and local level. Um, and we have a very specific vision about improving the lives of the urban poor um, and look at working in uh, 20 countries by 2030. Um, and so unlike some of the other city networks and some of the other organizations here, we don't just focus on climate change. We have a much more holistic approach uh, to urban development and cities. Um, and part of that involves having lots of different members who come from these, uh, these different uh, you know, speak different languages and, and bring different things to the table. So we have uh, a lot of the city networks represented, but we also have a lot of national governments represented um, in our membership. Um, and we have some universities and research centers, although you will note that that is one of our smaller uh, partner uh, membership groups. Um, and we also bring some private sector foundations in um, and a lot of the multilateral organizations. So not only the UN, a few of the UN, UN agencies, but also the World Bank. Um, and and the non-governmental organizations, I think, are extremely important here. So uh, unfortunately, they're all acronyms. But um, HFHI is um, Habitat for Humanity International. And SDI is the Slum Dwellers International. Um, and WEGO is Women in Formal Economies Globalizing and Organizing. It's a terrible name. Um, but they're a wonderful organization. Um, and so they mostly work with uh, people who work in informal economies, um, informal traders and informal workers. And SDI, of course, works a lot with slum dwellers um, and working with uh, informal settlements. Um, so as it was mentioned in Brenda's presentation, this issue of informality came out very strongly. And this was something that was extremely important for Cities Alliance, um, given our membership and our mission. So we focus both at the global level and also we work at the country level. So at the global level, we're really driven by the sustainable development goals, but also the Paris Agreement and of course the new urban agenda. Um, we have what we call four thematic lenses. So we work on equitable economic growth. So looking at um, economic growth in cities um, from a more inclusive standpoint um, and what kind of growth needs to happen, especially in secondary cities um, that all uh, citizens benefit from. We have a strong work program on gender, uh, both about women's empowerment as well as gender mainstreaming. Um, resilience and climate change, uh, so that's the area that I lead up. And then finally, we're adding um, work on migration, as we've seen that increasingly is becoming an important issue that cities in the Global South are dealing with, um, and looking at it from the perspective of migration, not just to uh, developed countries, which of course sort of makes it into the news a lot, but migration from secondary cities to primary cities, and then migration within regions. Um, and in order to support these lenses, we work a lot on advocacy, as with something like the Cities IPCC, but also on knowledge products and tools, um, and really enhancing dialogues to share learnings um, at the global level. 
We also have a country level, and um, as I said here, we focus not just at the city level, but also uh, working with the national government on the development of urban policies, but also making sure that there are enabling frameworks in place for cities to take action. And then we also work at the local level, um, so we uh, support a lot of public participation, community organizing. Um, we also have what we call community upgrading funds, which are small scale grants um, that we give to community groups, um, and they decide how to spend this on small scale infrastructure projects or on capacity building and soft skills. Um, but we really, here at the country level, um, again, um, focus on this integrated approach. So it's not just about environment and isolation, but also looking at issues of citizenship, services, economy, and governance. Um, and services is extremely important for us because we find this is one of the areas that, especially secondary cities, um, given both human resources and financial capacity limitations, are really struggling to deliver services um, to the local population. So then I just wanted to go into uh, more detail about uh, a couple of initiatives that we're involved with that I think is particularly relevant here. Um, so one of them is uh, here in the region in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, and this is the Urban Housing Practitioners Hub. Um, and what's kind of interesting about this is uh, it, sort of, it sort of relates to a lot of the things that we've been talking about, but it's really focused on practitioners. Um, and it's really looking at housing as a central um, uh, a key area that needs to um, needs more attention as part of the new urban agenda, but that housing is a key issue here in the Latin America region, um, and so. This again brings together um, lots of different members. Um, you can see there's a lot of international organizations, um, the, the World Bank, but also civil society organizations um, to try to enhance this learning uh, between practitioners. But what's interesting is that recently they, um, as they've started to decide what different, what they call a labs or housing laboratories they need, they realized that resilience was one of the areas that really needed a focus um, with housing. And so this has uh, become one of the areas that both online on the website, there's um, the opportunity to exchange ideas and knowledge about uh, resilience in housing, but also in an upcoming forum that they'll have actually next week, um, which is about housing at the center of the new urban agenda. There will be a session specifically devoted to resilience and looking at climate change and housing. So this is, I think, just one example, looking at it from a slightly different angle. So instead of looking at it from the climate change sector and how it needs to better work with urban networks or a deal, deal with cities, how this is something, housing, that's a very traditional urban sector that's been dealt with a lot, but how it's adapting more to take into account resilience and climate change. Um, another initiative that we have, which is at the global level, is called the Joint Work Program on Resilient Cities. Um, and this brings together 25 <coughs> members, observers, and knowledge partners. Um, and this is, um, the vision of this uh, Joint Work Program is about global partnerships, but also local initiatives that look at resilience in a long-term lens, um, with a focus on the urban poor, and puts informality really at the center of the response to, um, to resilience. And so, as you can see, again, there's this very diverse membership representation here. Some of them, like Slum Dwellers International, which have more of this informality and, um, and uh, urban poor focus, and some of them, like the World Bank, which you, you know, may not necessarily associate with a working urban poor focus, but of course, um, do a lot when it comes to resilience and have a lot um, to do with finance and how finance is, is attributed. Um, and it also brings together some more research-oriented organizations, but it, again, I think is probably more focused really at a practitioner level and bringing together practitioners that are working at the global level or in cities um, on issues of resilience. And so we have a couple of projects under that I just wanted to highlight. Um, so one of them is uh, was implemented by ICLE and it had a focus on uh, finance. And so I think what's come up earlier a little bit is about this issue of finance, but finance for resilience and adaptation tends to be a bit more difficult. Um, the private sector and some of uh, the financing institutions don't always see the bankability with resilience and, and adaptation projects. Um, they tend to focus a bit more on mitigation, which tend to have a better return on investment. And so this was really about building capacity for cities to develop more bankable um, and feasible resilience projects, but also connecting those projects with potential funders and implementing partners. And this is part of an ongoing project that ICLE has, which is the Transformative Action Programs, which has found uh, projects from around the world that work on um, climate change, both adaptation and mitigation. Um, a second project was with C40, which is on the 
about technical assistance for city level climate action planning. And this is a different um, tool, the Climate Action for Sustainability tool, or uh, known as the CURB tool. One of the interesting things here was, is this is about um, assessing GHG commitments and reductions at the city level. Um, but what we um, worked with them on is uh, enhancing the tool's functionality in informal settlements. Because the way the tool worked kind of looked at a, the city kind of as a homogenous unit and didn't really take into account that when you're looking at GHG emissions, they're very different in informal settlements. And of course, because a lot of the cities that we're working with in the Global South, in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, informality makes, such, makes up such a large part of the city. So if you're not understanding how to look at GHG emissions differently there, you're not really getting a full picture of the city. Um, the, the third project is uh, with WRI, the World Resources Institute, as well as 100 Resilient Cities. And this was looking at um, urban community resilience in informal settlements at the neighborhood level. So this is really going down a scale. So it's not really, um, it looks at city level resilience, but it was looking at the difference uh, between different neighborhoods in three cities, um, in Brazil, India, and Indonesia. And so it was trying to understand um, what are different types of vulnerabilities that people are facing at the neighborhood level Level, and also um, inputting back into the city resilience plan to understand that people depending on, for example, if the, uh, in India, for example, they looked at sl um, some slum communities that were older and more established uh, versus newer ones that had uh, been um, created more recently and tended to have more uh, migrant populations. And they had different vulnerabilities that they were dealing with. Um, and so I think that project highlights uh, some of these issues about scale that we've been talking about as well. And then the final one is actually something that's being implemented more at the regional level and has much more of an advocacy approach. Um, and this is um, really about making the business case for adaptation for cities. Um, so sometimes cities, you know, there's been a lot of focus on mitigation um, and why that makes sense for them and sometimes seeing the economic uh, sense for why adaptation makes sense isn't there, but also understanding um, and advocating adaptation that benefits all inhabitants, right? So um, sometimes adaptation programs, uh, you know, tend to focus on one area, whether it's a physical area or whether it sort of benefits one group more than, than another. So making sure that especially the most vulnerable um, are taken into adaptation. And so that was, um, that's being done, unfortunately, not in this region. Uh, in, in they had a regional forum in Africa, and they'll have one in Asia. But there will be these forthcoming publications that will look at the business case that I think will be useful for cities um, around the world. And then um, the other thing that Cities Alliance is involved with is um, something called the Medellin Collaboration for Urban Resilience. So this came out of the Wor World Urban Forum um, that was held in Medellin, I'm going to guess six years ago. I think that sounds about right. Um, and so this was about promoting uh, joint collaboration on strengthening resilience. Um, again, it's really about addressing uh, some of these global agendas and working in partnership and exchanging um, on knowledge and research. Um, but the group has a slightly different approach, and in this case, we've selected five, six, looks like six now, pilot cities, of which Mexico City is one of them. And essentially what it is here is we're trying to get those international organizations that are a bit blocked at the bottom here, but UN Habitat, the World Bank, Cities Alliance, um, ICLE, C40, Rockefeller, to make sure that we have um, a more harmonized approach when we're working with cities. Um, and so this is something that, um, yeah, that we've, um, really is just getting kicked off in the past year, but we're looking at ways that we can better collaborate between ourselves to make sure that we um, are not overburdening cities, as Seth mentioned in his presentation. And one of the joint collaborations that we've done here is a website called resiliencetools.org. Um, and this brings together different tools on resilience as well as publications and case studies. Um, and you know, this is an attempt because what happens a lot is different organizations develop their own tools, but then sometimes are not utilizing the tools of other organizations. So it's, it's a way to try to bring them all together um, so that both other international organizations know what's going on, but also that cities and local organizations can tap into a variety of tools and, and utilize the one that um, is most relevant for them. 
So that's all about Cities Alliance. Uh, I'm going to go very quickly through the, uh, the three city networks that were part of the Cities IPCC partnership. So first um, is C40. Um, and this one is, C40 is interesting, I think, because one, it focuses on the world's mega cities. So it's 96 of the world's mega cities. Um, and it is focused on climate change. It has a very specific focus on climate change. Um, and it's working specifically about turning the Paris Agreement from aspiration to action. So it's really about working with cities on the commitments that they've made, but also in many cases going beyond what the national government has done and being much more ambitious with their targets. Um, and essentially they have a, kind of a theory of change that lays this out. And the first point is really about engaging mayoral leadership. They really see mayors as a main entry point um, for how to get change done at a city level. And so they um, are led by mayors, they engage with mayors, they have a, um, a lot of you know, spotlighting mayors and what they've done. Um, and then, but also backing this up by supporting cities to um, do robust inventories, targets, and plans. So really looking at tools, capacity for how that they can um, meet these ambitious targets. And then look at doing a lot with through peer-to-peer -peer action and direct support. Um, so this is really key is that they found cities learn best from each other and so bringing together these cities to learn from each other. But there's also an issue and um, as I said, this is something Cities Alliance works on is about removing these barriers. What, what can we do to enable city climate action? And, and Seth talked about that a little bit, is that many things aren't within the control of cities. So working with cities either to focus on the things that are within their control or to remove some of these barriers. Um, and then there's this you know, advocacy piece um, about global thought leadership and, and holding events and, and communications. That was C40 in a nutshell. Next is Ikle. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because the, he's more of an expert than I am. He's gonna present after me. Um, but Ikle is also a global network, um, but has many more cities with, it's over uh, 1,500 cities, towns, and regions. So it's not just focused on the mega cities. Um, and it's about uh, sustainable, sustainability and building a sustainable future. Um, it also has a, or, it also emphasizes the fact that local action is what really can drive this global change um, and that the leadership of local and regional governments is really essential to meeting these global sustainable development goals. Um, in terms of, I don't know why that happened, okay. Uh, oh no. Um, Okay, great. Um, these are just a, a sampling of some of the different types of projects that ICLE has at the global level. So looking not just um, at uh, you know, issues of there's eco-mobility, there's issues about food, um, issues about energy and biodiversity, and, um, and again about this ambitious city action. And I think that's a reoccurring theme uh, with a lot of the city networks. Um, next is UCLG, which is the United Cities and Local Governments um, organization. And this is also a global, oh man, this one goes on its own. Okay, this is very exciting. <laughs> I don't know how to make this up. Um, and, oh, okay. So what's interesting about UCLG, I think, is that it, it's not climate change focused solely. Um, it brings together a lot of um, different cities and local governments. Um, and it has much more of a focus on governance. And if anything, oh geez, okay, now we're just gonna roll through the whole presentation. Okay, no, good stuff. Okay, so I think, um, and you know, this issue of governance I think is extremely important. And it came up a lot in the breakout group that I was in yesterday with the Talanoa Dialogues, right? Is that we can't talk about climate change ambitions, or we can't talk about the state of environment in isolation, because of course governance is a major issue. Um, and governance both limits and you know, is, is, um, enables the, the changes that we need to see. Um, and so I think the, that having UCLG with this more governance focus and, and bringing together um, another you know, wide network of cities and local governments is essential. Okay. So, you've already seen this slide, so I'm not gonna dwell on it too much. You can tell we're quite proud of our Cities IPCC partnership, right? We brought these different organizations together. We're really happy that it worked. Um, and, you know, I think the thing is that, um, in, as you see, many of us are working together on different fronts, um, but this was a very specific um, engagement and it brought in the, the IPCC, IPCC, which was, um, 
quite unusual. This was the first time they'd really partnered on something major like this. Um, and it also, I think, challenged us in different ways. It challenged them to see the value of working in partnership with organizations that weren't just scientific and research organizations, but also had a different perspective. Um, and I think that it also, we learned a lot about the way IPCC assessments are brought about and how we can make them more useful for different audiences and relevant. Um, and also, as Brenna mentioned, having a really strong leadership from Edmonton as our host city, I think also brought in the perspective of, you know, the, this is essentially our client in this. These, this is who we need to be working with to make sure this, this happens. Um, so, given all this, um, and given that we're at a university and, you know, I don't know, I thought it'd be fun to sort of grade us on how we're doing so far. So this is just really my view about how I think the City Networks and Cities Alliance and to some extent the Cities IPCC partnership is doing already to address the research agenda and where I think we have a lot of room for improvement. So first, if we look at the cross-cutting knowledge gaps, which <laughs> Brenna brought up, so there were four of them, urbanization, scale, city level data, and systems approach. So on urbanization, it makes sense. This is something that the City Networks, Cities Alliance, we've focused a lot on this. So I gave us a B plus. I think we're doing pretty well on that one. There's room for improvement, of course, um, but I actually, this is something that you know, we have focused a lot on. Um, on the issue of scale, especially the issue of temporal scale, I think we're lacking here. Um, I think this is something that we could do a lot better on. So I gave us a D, that's not great. Um, city level data, again, there's obviously rooms for improvement in terms of modeling and scenarios, but I think this is something that the city networks and the global covenant mayors has really focused a lot on. So I feel like we are making a lot of progress here. So I gave us a B. The thing that I failed us on, because I don't think that the city networks and those of us who are more focused on urban have done a very good job on is this systems approach. It's just not something that we, are really applying or maybe know how to apply. It might be a capacity issue, but I don't think that this is the way that we're looking at um, urbanization and climate change issues. And so I think this is one of the areas where I could see coming from the research and action agenda that we would need to work on a lot. Um, in terms of the research gaps, um, so for informality, of course, oh no, Brenna, don't, don't put this one out. Okay, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, you know, I think for informality, Cities Alliance and the joint work program, we are making strides in this area. Um, of course, there's a lot more to be done, um, and I think especially about making these linkages on both mitigation and adaptation, but I felt pretty good about this one. Also, pol politics, governance, and institutions. Again, there's room for improvement, but I think this is something the city networks are really focused on. So I think it's more about improving on what is our, we're already doing and taking it um, and better integrating with... Um, with uh, the research um, organizations and sort of working better to bring this partnership on these two issues. The thing that we're actually not doing very well on is urban planning and design. I really feel like this is lacking with climate change links. And maybe I'm more critical on this because I actually have an urban planning background and I think yeah, I don't, I don't think I learned anything when I studied urban planning about climate change and how to address this when you're dealing with urban planning in cities. It just really wasn't a part of the curriculum. It hasn't been something that's been really emphasized. And so I think, you know, from the climate change community, they, we see urban planning and design as a way to make a response. But I don't know that from the urban network side, from sort of, a, uh, yeah, a more urban-centric focus, I don't think we've done a particularly good air, job on this. So... I rated that one a little negatively. Um, the built and natural environment, I think we're starting to see more from the city networks on this, but I think there is so much more that could be done, obviously. Um, also, the same with sustainable consumption and production. So Anne Helen brought up um, the C40 tool. Um, UN Environment has a long history of working on this as well, but I think this is an area that, um, especially because of, of um, how damaging it can be, I think it's something we need to work on for more. Finance is a tricky one. Finance is one that everybody talks about all the time, right? Um, it, everybody's well aware of the need for finance. Um, and so a lot of us are working on it. But of course, we could do better, I think. But um, um, especially, like I said, around finance for adaptation, finance for secondary cities, um, and not just primary cities, um, there remain a lot of issues here. Um, the big one that I think we do the worst on in the research gaps is this issue of uncertainty. Um, and I think that we are not doing well enough also in working with cities to better understand uncertainty when they're dealing with 
uh, planning for a future city or setting ambitious goals. We just, um, it's not something that we've wrapped our head around well enough, I think. And then finally on the recommended actions, so this knowledge co-design and co-production, um, I think this is something that with cities IPCC, but also with the joint work program, it's something that um, is very important. And, and Gian, you touched on this issue of sort of journal articles and literature that's mostly uh, from, from developed countries and not so much from developing countries. But one of the big things, uh, especially for, for Cities Alliance, is that there's so much data out there and there's th lots of things that are being generated from local communities um, and at the city level and, and recognizing that there is knowledge there and bringing that into um, and better incorporating that into um, and climate change I think is really important and I think it, um, it has a big potential, especially in Global South and secondary cities where sort of rigorous academic ass assessments may not be um, as practical. The one thing that I think the city networks, of course, are doing a great job on is empowering cities to take action. Um, I think that's something they've, they've really shown leadership in, and there was a question, I think, about like the UNFCCC and, and IPCC, and I think you see a progression in both those spaces of the recognition of cities um, and uh, cities feeling empowered to take action there, and I think that's um, something that we can look at as a success, but of course, the work is never done. The thing that I think we probably need to work on the most out of the recommended actions, fostering this long-term collaboration. So Cities IPCC was an excellent example of how when we have a shared common goal, we can work together very well on this. Um, and I think we brought, um, you know, we sort of brought out the best in, in each other and, and we were able to really come together around something that mattered and that we felt had, had an importance. I think the, the challenge is how to do this over a longer term scale and how to do this not just at a global level but also at a national level or in cities or at regional, whatever the, the scale that's most important. I think that's much more challenging because finding that motivation, finding the, the funding, finding um, you know the mechanisms to keep that going around a shared goal is really difficult. So that's something that I think um, as we look at how to implement the research and action agenda is something that we're really gonna have to have to figure out how to do. So that's it. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thanks, Julie.